All right, Alexander, let's talk about a lot of stuff going on, actually. Let's focus this, uh, this video. We'll do a two-parter, again, a two-part video. Let's do the first part on uh, Biden and OPEC Plus and what's going on there with uh, oil and energy and the fact that Biden is looking to, to blame all of his terrible policy decisions in just eight, nine months, and he's looking to, to blame it on OPEC and actually try to get OPEC to bail him out. That's what he's looking to do. OPEC Plus, actually. And you'll explain what OPEC Plus is. We'll do the first part of the video on that, and then we'll shift gears and uh, we'll segue into the G20 and the COP26 uh, meetings, and we'll talk about what's going on there. The G20 wrapped up. COP26 is starting up. And once again, Biden is, I would say, the, the center of it all. Uh, not in a good way, <laughs> not in a good way, but let's begin with uh, a very important story, and that is uh, the energy crisis, uh, Biden wanting OPEC Plus to bail him out, OPEC Plus saying, no thank you, here's the title from Zero Hedge before you begin, Alexander, OPEC Plus box at Biden's demand, demands for more oil production, kind of sums it up, doesn't it? What's going on uh here? Absolutely. Now, let's just understand what OPEC Plus is. OPEC Plus is OPEC. OPEC is the oil producers cartel, which has existed since the 50s and 60s, and which is essentially led by, the, by Saudi Arabia. Though other countries like Iran and Venezuela are also members, but they are the core cartel which in the 60s and 70s, especially the 70s, achieved so much dominance over the oil market and appeared to be controlling the oil market. Now, what has happened since the 70s is that Saudi Arabia's position as a swing producer, a swing oil producer, has gradually diminished as the two other big oil producers have become more important in the world energy market. One is the United States, and the other is Russia. And Russia today uh, produces roughly the same amount of oil in any one year as Saudi Arabia does. And the United States, until a f very recently, was producing slightly more. Now, Saudi Arabia and OPEC couldn't dominate the oil market in the way they once could by themselves because of these two big other producers which have appeared on the scene. So they forged an energy alliance with Russia, and that is OPEC+. Plus. So OPEC+, Plus is Saudi Arabia and OPEC plus Russia. Russia is not a formal member of OPEC, but in practice it virtually is, and that's why we talk about OPEC+. Plus. The United States, of course, does not join institutions like OPEC, there is no conceivable way, for example, that U.S. oil producers would ever agree to reduce oil production by themselves of their own volition. Um, that, that's simply not something that the United States would ever do. The Saudis, the Russians can come to those sort of agreements. Now, that's what OPEC Plus is. But OPEC Plus obviously has a very big role in the oil market because it brings together these two very big blocks of producers, the Saudis, the Russians, the other o o OPEC countries. And what we've seen over the last year is energy prices surge. We've talked a lot on our channel about the energy crisis in Europe, which is related to natural gas shortages. But it's still the case that the single most important energy traded commodity in energy is oil, and oil prices have been spiking. They are rising very fast. And the reason why oil prices are rising is because all other prices are rising. And the reason all other prices are rising and oil prices are rising is because, as we've discussed several times on our programs, fiscal and monetary policy in the United States has become impossible. The scale of money emission in the United States has been astonishing, and that has created inflation, including inflation in energy prices. The problem is 
that energy prices, rising energy prices, create their own inflation. Because as energy is something we all use, every one of us has to use, every economy, every industry works on energy, every household requires energy. If energy costs rise, all other costs have to rise at some point in order to compensate for the rise in energy costs. So if energy costs are rising, then inflation also will rise. It's like, you know, you, it's a billiard board. It knocks one and the other just sort of move, moves along that way. Now, the United States, the Biden administration, has, of course, also done various things which have added to this problem. They stopped the Keystone Pipeline. <laughs> they also have acted in ways that many people see as unfavorable to the fracking industry. They're very keen on green policies. And, of course, that's probably also added a further upward lift to energy prices. And it's also the case that whereas the United States just a year ago, two years ago, was the world's biggest oil producer, it, that position is now slipping and it's no longer quite as dominant or quite as central to the energy markets as it was. So what does the administration do? They promised everybody that inflation was going to be transitory, that there was, you know, this is all uh, 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 not going to, you know, take hold in any extent. They see that, in fact, on the contrary, prices are rising everywhere, on every, practically every goods now. They are also becoming increasingly concerned about energy costs. They're no doubt worried about the fact that as energy prices rise, as gas prices rise, gas bills are going to grow in the United States in the winter, which is politically sensitive, especially in an election year as 2022 is going to be. So they want to get those prices down. But they won't admit that they themselves have largely created this problem by all that money admission, which has generated so much inflation. What they're saying is it's those wicked oil producers that are not flooding the world with oil to make up for the fact that we've flooded the world with money, with dollars. And because they're not flooding the world with oil, they are responsible for the fact that energy prices are spiking. So it is a, both a game of blame shifting, blame the Saudis, blame the Russians, blame the oil producers for the fact that there is energy inflation and that's going to add a further spike and spiral upward to inflation. And at the same time, it's also a rather desperate attempt to get on top of the inflation by trying to persuade and pressure and bully the oil producers to increase production of oil to a greater extent in order to bring energy prices down before the politically sensitive winter. Yeah. Um, transitory for just for three, four years, it'll be transitory. Oh, absolutely. Just for three, four years. Yeah, um, yeah it's, it's incredible. You know, you're going to, you're going to, uh, Blame Saudi Arabia, continue to sanction Russia, maybe even start up a war in Ukraine with Russia, but you're going to beg them to, to help bail you out uh, because of your failed energy policies and your energy mismanagement. It is absolutely incredible to believe that Biden has done this in under a year, that the U.S. was number one when it came to energy production, and now it is, uh, it is begging begging Saudi Arabia and Russia to bail them out. Here's a paragraph from, from Zero Hedge, which I think pretty much sums it up, and you can comment on it. It says, speaking to reporters in Rome, a senior U.S. official said that the U.S. is talking to other energy-consuming nations about how to press OPEC Plus to boost output to address the current supply crunch. That such pleas aimed at OPEC Plus come from the same admin which ended the Keystone XL pipeline on its first day and has done everything to crush shale capex in the U.S. is hardly a surprise. <laughs> well, indeed, uh, I, I mean it, it does. It does say it all, actually. I mean, it, it shows how the the administration comes to everything with this moralistic, ideological approach, 
what we do is good and right because it's ideologically right and it is as we as we define mora morality it is morally good so if other people don't play along with us they're being bad and wicked and the fact that we're doing terrible things to them at the same time like sanctioning them is something of course that they should ignore and disregard because they ought to be acting like good players and they need to reduce uh, energy costs for us by increasing production for us in order to get us out of trouble. So it's this extraordinary bizarre attitude that, you know, you can be as horrible as you like to the Russians. You can create as much trouble for the Russians as possible. You can be as horrible as you like to the Saudis. The US administration has not been sympathetic to the Saudis. It stopped backing the war in Yemen. It issued a report which said that MBS had been responsible for Khashoggi's death. I think it was right to do both things. But, you know, that's not, let's be straightforward about it, a way to make friends in Riyadh. That's what they did. And they imagine that despite all of that, and despite showing no willingness to bend towards these countries at all, they think that nonetheless these countries owe, the, owe them a favour and should increase energy prices to bail them out of their difficulties. And of course, what do they do when those countries say no? And both the Saudis and the Russians have now said no. The king of Saudi Arabia said that he was only going to seek balance in the energy market. He was not going to do what the um, administration wants. And Putin has made a very tough speech to the G20 summit, which I've done a program about on locals, in which he said that the entire blame for worldwide inflation is the, is the fiscal and monetary policies followed by the administration in the United States. It's not us. Those countries are not going to do what the US wants. So what does the US try to do? It tries to threaten them even more, bully them into obedience to an even greater extent. I say the United States... I, of course, mean the administration. Yeah, but will this hold? Will this no from Saudi Arabia and from Russia continue to hold? And how else, in what ways, will the U.S. ramp up its bullying? I mean, what are the, what's the leverage? What other mechanisms and leverage can the U.S. exert on Saudi Arabia and Russia to try and get them from a no to a yes? I can't see. I can't see that it has any. Actually, <laughs> what, what tools does it realistically have? And as for the Russians and the Saudis, they've made it made clear many, many times that they do not want to see energy prices go through the roof because it isn't ultimately in their long-term interests that it should. It creates instability and volatility in the world economy, which they don't work, benefit from. They would like to see more stable policies overall. But as Putin very correctly said in that speech to the G20 summit, the reason we don't have predictable, poli predictable uh, uh, policies, we can't follow predictable actions in the energy markets because there is no stability in those markets, is because the United States, which has the dominant economy in the world, may not be quite as big as it used to be relative to all the others. China is now a big country too, but it's still the United States that has the reserve currency, the dollar. Because the problem is that it's the United States government, especially under this administration, which doesn't follow predictable and stable policies. And by the way, on the subject of energy, you talked about how uh, the US position in energy has you know, basically disintegrated in an incredibly short space of time. There is no better indicator of that than something which isn't mentioned in that Zero Hedge article, which is that the US is now importing oil and gas from Russia. <laughs> I mean, this is this is an astonishing turn of the you know turn of things round. I mean, just a year ago, two years ago. They were talking about exporting American liquefied natural gas to Europe to counter Russia. And now they're importing oil and gas from Russia themselves.
And they were still lobbying up, up until like literally yesterday. They were still lobbying and pressing Germany to not go ahead with Nord Stream 2. Meanwhile, they're importing Russian uh, gas. It's, it is such a, such a freakish Frankenstein policy from, uh, from the Biden administration. I, <laughs> why does it? Uh, okay. What if Saudi Arabia and Russia decide to put the squeeze on Biden? And to uh, to not only continue to to continue to say no, and to uh, do exactly the opposite of what he is begging them to do, and to really put the squeeze on Biden now that he's weak, he's exposed, and he's actually begging them for help. Why should they help him? And why not? Why should they help him? But not only not help him, really put the squeeze on him now. Well, I don't I don't see why they wouldn't to be straightforward about it. I mean, this is one of the one of the paradoxes of this, which is, of course, the United States sees itself as entitled to sanction everybody, to put economic pressure on everyone. The idea that somebody might one day just do the same to the United States is something Americans, I think, find impossible to imagine. But in fact, it is fully imaginable. It could happen. It did happen once in 1973, when the Arab states imposed briefly an oil embargo on the United States and on the West, which caused severe pressure in the United States at that time, as I can very well remember. I don't think we're going to come to anything like that now. But I'm going to say this. I don't think that the Saudis and the Russians are going to crumble this time. I think as far as they're concerned, I think they have basically had it up to there with this administration. And I think if Biden-Harris comes calling for favours, they're not going to get any, because as far as the Russians and the Saudis and other oil producers, which include such US-friendly countries as Venezuela and Iran, are concerned, they have no reason at all to help Biden. I'm not sure that they're going to want to put the squeeze on Biden and on the administration even more, because I suspect that they will calculate that if they do that, that will simply infuriate the United States, and it might actually make it more likely that the United States would come for them in all sorts of ways which are unpredictable. But I don't think they're going to help the administration at all. Why would they, in fact? And if you follow the comments that Biden has been making following the G20 meeting in Rome, he's been going out of his way to criticise both the Russians and the Saudis again, both for failing to meet their sea targets, we all know what I mean, and at the same time for failing to ramp up oil production. <laughs> the fact that he doesn't see any contradiction between these two things is another perfect example of how uh, uh, this administration or this president thinks he can, you know, what's what, what the American expression, chew gum <laughs> and walk them at the same time. I mean, it's just, it's, it's quite amazing, actually. It also exposes what a sham the whole, this whole COP26 thing is. I mean, what a, oh, what a, a complete one. sham. What a, what a, what, it's a wealth transfer. Let's just leave it there. It's, it's well, a it wealth is. transfer. That's it what this is. whole thing is. And, and, is. and Biden is talking from both sides of his mouth. Uh, not to his fault. He probably doesn't even understand what he's saying either. Once again, I always I say just just give him some ice cream and, and put him in the corner <laughs> somewhere. But um, final question: You know, you say that they're not going to uh, that they're not going to put the squeeze on uh, on Biden in the U.S. You know, Putin is a, a real politic type of uh, of uh, leader and uh, politician. But he's also human. I wonder if in the back of his mind, he still is, he's, he's saying to himself, you know, I'm, I'm going to squeeze him just a little bit. After all, he did call me a killer and he is constantly, uh, you know, going after me. Let me just squeeze them just a little bit. I, I, I'm sure he does. I'm sure that temptation for him is there. And I'm at all surprised if he succumbs to it. Why wouldn't he? I mean, that's the other thing. I mean, you know, the administration talks about all the terrible things it's going to do. It's going to try to put together, cobble together a coalition of consumer countries to force the oil producers to, uh, um, you know, to change their policies. 
I mean, it's just fantasy. It's just, it's, I mean, what, what can the oil consumers do in this situation? The biggest energy consumer, apart from the United States, is China. And China has, of course, made long-term deals with the Russians and with the Saudis. It's got problems in its energy economy. It's very severe problems. But it doesn't see the solution to those in order to try and you know, go around bullying the Saudis and the Russians. The Russians, of course, it has very close relations with now in order to help the United States. As for the European countries, well, as far as the Russians are concerned, and I suspect as far as the, European, the Saudis are also concerned, the uh, Europeans today are nothing more than a pro-American clack. They don't pay any attention to them. So, I mean, what practically can the US do that's going to put real pressure on the Russians and the Saudis to change their policies? Given that there's no goodwill, because the goodwill's gone. Given that there's no trust, because there is no, there is none. Given the, you know that they they see the administration is led by a pack of neocons who are out to cause trouble for them all the time. Why would the Russians and the Saudis change their policies? And if, of course, the Germans and the French and the British and the Italians and all those people, the Japanese, come, you know, calling and saying, you know, you know, this is very bad what you're doing. Well. They'll, they'll, they'll probably say to those people, well, you know, you're just the messenger. We prefer, prefer to talk with the person who sent you. Why should we waste our time with the monkey when we're standing up to the organ grinder? Yeah. This explains why Saudi Arabia has uh, started to hedge its bets against the U.S. and has shifted uh, towards the east a bit, something that is really unprecedented. Of course, Russia made the shift a long time ago, and they're pretty much in the clear. I don't want to say they're sanctions proof, but no. you know, any any sanctions that the U.S. levies on them at this point is just doesn't have any meaning whatsoever. Absolutely, um, they become yeah. they become more resistant to sanctions with every sanctions wave. The sanctions, every sanctions wave, makes them more resistant to the next one. Yeah, it's uh, the media doesn't report any of this. All they're all they're focusing on is all the climate stuff, but they're not reporting any of the of the uh, the facts about the U.S. importing energy from Russia. It, it's it's laughable. It really is I, laughable. Just in ten months, in ten months, he has done this. I agree. Yeah, I know. You know, wait, just wait. You know. Good, you know, fasten your seatbelts. <laughs> We've got, was it, another three years and two months left? Yeah. Yeah. Let's shift to, yeah. Okay. So let's shift to the other disaster, which is the G20 and the COP26. 